Ah, very draft, draft science video. Um, just some stuff I've been thinking about, about the two slit experiment and um, coming up with some other explanation than Huygens and all that stuff. So let's go to the single slit, really. That's the, that's the one to figure out. Um, and um, yeah, you just don't have the convenience of the, the two waves. And so you're really just competing with the Huygens theory which is, um, you know, this idea that somehow photons have a, a wave mechanism in front of them that they recreate themselves into the future. Um, that somehow it travels faster than light. That's, you know, photons are <laughs> moving the speed of light. Um, this property they have anyway. Um, zooms into the future um, and it does it with some sort of infinite capacity to make straight line waves out of round waves and you know it's very convoluted and um, so yeah the, the standard isn't very high in terms of just making something up uh, but yeah I'd like to be able to make something mechanical that doesn't rely on any uh, doesn't stretch credulity uh, quite as much in terms of um, having some evidence or some reason to believe. So, um, as I'm thinking, so, so the problem really is, is okay, the, the single slit starts off with a nothing pattern, right? So if you have the slit wide open, it's barely a pattern. And then you start to get a little bit of a pattern. So you first you have to explain why it, it begins. And then, uh, you know, as you narrow the slit, you get a very strong pattern. And then as you make the slit really small, you get very weak pattern. So it's kind of like a zooming in. You know, you're zooming out. You're, you're zooming in, you're going further out, and then you go f so far away that you barely see the thing anymore. Kind of an idea. Um, and, um, you know, so coming up with some kind of mechanism where the angles obviously have to change in proportion to the width of the slit in terms of the which, you know, the how, how much the light is getting deflected and from how many locations it's getting deflected, you would argue. So there's only very few locations here and very little deflection in a sense. Except this, this pattern is as wide as this one. It's just less detail. So that's something to keep into consideration. This pattern is truly smaller. So this full pattern and this weak pattern are actually probably the same length and it's this one where things start to go very small when you're you know when you have and <clears throat> when you're just starting to create some sort of reason for it to care um, where apparently you're stretching some sort of limit of the wave function which um, in, you know sort of to me doesn't make much sense but this slit width would be um, it's much smaller than the double slit. So this single slit is not Huygensing very well at this distance, and yet the double slit in total would be much larger than this distance, and somehow the wave front is able to get across the entirety of the, the double slit um, to create the two waves, and yet it can't do it <coughs> with the single slit for some reason, some unexplained reason. So anyway, um, yeah, so my theory is is that there, this is an electrical phenomenon in the sense that um, we know that gaps in materials um, induce uh, the, the possibility of uh, electrical exchange. So the, you know, less gap, more potential for an electrical discharge and that some kind of mechanism facilitates that and is related to electrons. Uh, creating a pathway for eventually the electricity, and um, so this goes back to to the basic fundamental idea of um, what I say is creating what we know of as the repulsive force. So here's a, another quick drawing of this would be an electron, this would be a, a proton. The let's call these frisbees little blue ones and what's called the red ones baseballs um, and um, so the, the blue ones only only um, reflect blue and the reds only reflect reds and inversely they 
they divert the opposite. So you could understand that anything that's reflective between these two would all leak out. So there would be a very low pressure between them. In the converse case of two electrons, yeah, all the baseballs would leak out, but all the frisbees would be bouncing back and forth. And the closer you brought the two things, the stronger that force would be. Uh, even though it's the same force, the same amount of frisbees, the fact that you're bringing it closer means they're bouncing more, which is causing more impacts, which is really the definition of the, the event of force. Um, so, and it does explain very well, um, you know, it fits very nicely into the idea of this pushing magnets together and the very way it feels um, so um, responsive, uh, like there's almost a, an infinite potential, you know, or a, you know, you can cut it as fine as you want because all you're playing with is stuff bouncing back and forth, so it's a perfect potentiometer, you know, in the sense that the the repulsive force gets stronger, um, you know, just in perfect proportion to the proximity of the magnets. Um, so anyway, it's a nice explanation anyway, it fits, and so it's, um, it's a nice um, way to represent the repulsive force, and I guess I would argue that it's there is no attraction, there's just the absence of the repulsion. So, in the circumstance of the proton and the electron, you're just losing the repulsion. And that ends up being attraction when you live in a world of stuff pushing on you all the time. Um, so there is no real attraction. Attraction was always the difficult force to explain. Uh, conceptually, it's, you know, the, the pull thing. The pull thing doesn't have any, you can't, oh, sorry, it's uh, not doing very well. <laughs> anyway, um, Lyme disease, yeah, well, and the penicillin doesn't do you much good. Um, the idea of uh, grabbing, you know, and pulling is, um, you, you can never do that in any simple way. It's always going to have to be some kind of process where a push is, can be a very simple force. Uh, all right, and so that's um, a plus on my side, so to speak, um, in defense of this kind of thinking. All right, so uh, now the problems, the, the problems I've been thinking about. Uh, one of them goes back to how I've always thought about atoms and how they interact, and even though there's so many of them, I mean, you know, an, an atom is to an apple what an apple is to the earth, you know, so there are a ton of them. We're given this description of them as being very, lots of empty space. And you always wonder about this idea of how molecules could ever connect to each other if the free electron is busy all the time, you know, and it's only going to be in the right place, essentially, to be really bonding or, or locking a very short amount of time and it just doesn't seem very likely that m molecules would be able to be in the right place at the right time. There'd be only some kind of 10,000 to 1 number or something and clearly some compounds seem a lot more reactive than that. <laughs> you know, they're, they can do very, um, very intense, very, you know, explosive <laughs> chemical reactions. You know, it just doesn't seem to fit that all that speed could be generated in a system where electrons are so shelly and fuzzy in terms of their location. And uh, the other thing was is that, you know, how do you hit this stuff? I mean, if this stuff is so small, I mean, how do you, you know, even if, you know, how does anything get opacancy? You know, how does anything achieve, um, you know, a capacity to block light um, if, um, there's so much empty space. And I really don't like the idea of bending light, you know, light being, you know, bent into anything. That's, uh, again, that's too complex a function. You need, it's, it's like you need this kind of model to create the bend. You'd almost need gravity, you know, some sort of gravity to create the reaction um, of, a tr of this 
dissecting of velocity, creating the two velocity problem. And again, the two velocity problem is, is I think, just counter to the idea of understanding force and all the elements of force as being bits that truly only have mass in the direction they're traveling. They have no reality in three dimensions. They only have a reality in the dimension they're traveling, essentially. They only have a material function. You, you just can't interact with them in any other way because they really don't have another way. Um, so, and that mass, if you really thought about how it's generated, if you, if you stuck a bunch of photons in a box, you could sort of understand that their mass would be felt in terms of their pressure pushing, you know, whenever they hit something. And that's the only time they would have mass, so it was all about their direction. They have no mass just sitting in the box if they never hit the sides. You'd never know they were there, kind of a thing. And so you can sort of understand that their their mass is just in the direction of their movement. All right, so long way around. So I've been playing with different arrangements of electrons and trying to figure out how you have two principles here. I mean, I like the idea that light is the stuff in between the electrons, the force bonding them, so that this would be photon. And if you if you had two electrons and you compressed one against another, this would tighten the, the force between them. And if the electron moved in an angle, it would release the trapped force, some bit of it, uh, depending on how long it was out of place. And that would be your photon. So to create a higher energy photon would require pressure. A greater pressure on an electron get the ping pong balls bouncing quicker and then they'll leave in that frequency and so that would be increasing and decreasing frequency and if you separate the electrons obviously then you'd create a bigger frequency which would be your infrared light um, you know the going down the you know the red shift versus blue shift would be about the compression of these electrons and I like that it seems to be um, it seems to fit the, the model of how frequency is created, how this, um, you know, like I said, if I literally used ping pong balls bouncing between something and move the thing so the ping pong balls could bounce out, you'd kind of see the idea that they'll, they'll bounce at a frequency. It'll leave as a, at a, as a specific frequency depending on how close the two things are to each other. So that's likable. So what we're talking about is somehow when a photon goes between the two, a uh, single slit, let's say, that um, what's happening is <coughs> it's, it's hitting something and in doing so it's causing a compression and then a release and it, the photon leaves at a new angle. So somehow the angle has to be created um, and I originally thought of that as being the fact that electrons don't don't fly straight. They can go in two angles. So there could be a compression. The electron leaves crooked, and if it leaves crooked, it compresses something else in a new direction. And that's sort of where I'm getting to, where you end up having to have layers of electrons, you know, in some sort of configuration. So one one electron moves a little, that compresses a force and then that force causes another electron to move which causes the release of the force between it and so you know unfortunately it would be nice if it was a simpler mechanism but yeah you can't expect the material reality to be um, you know the, 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 the mechanism can be simple but uh, yeah there's probably going to be some complexity in the arrangement of something so dense and tiny. Um, Alright, so another thought I had was about this whole thing where proton and electron release force. So this should be understood that this means it comes out in this entire 360. So it could go out this way, it could go out this way, it could go out that way. So the entire plane of this dimension 
is where this could leak out. So we can go left or right or up or down um, in terms of the force leaking. And that fits with magnetism and uh, all of the electrical stuff. Um, <clears throat> All right, see, now I'm so, so yeah, it's, it's it's getting enough complicated where you sort of have to <laughs> go through a a rather elaborate uh, the you know putting putting together just the axioms um, starts to get kind of lengthy. So the thought I had was about the protons and say say if these say if these were the uh, two protons. Um, connected to two pieces of matter. So this represents the material of the slit, so to speak. And let's just say these were protons. Now, <clears throat> the protons are losing all the blue, so there's no blue between them. And all they have is the red. So the only thing that exists between them is this, is their red. Just like this blue example, they would be just the opposite. There'd be red, red, and there'd be red trapped between them. So there's red going back and forth here. And what happens when you stick an electron in is the electron is just going to act, act like a, um, a leak. It's just going to leak all that red out. So as soon as I stick an electron in, well, and let's understand there's no blue between the two protons. So all the protons can do, you know, in their native state, I guess I should just draw it, is there's red trapped oh, right yeah it's hard to find good red pens i mean it's hard for me to find them okay so there's red trapped going back and forth but all the blue got evacuated uh, you know this way and this way and up and down so there's no blue between the protons at all and there's just red and so then when you stick uh say an electron falls in here or is pushed because everything's pushed. So an electron is pushed because there's pressure of the electrons. So the, other, the other thing got me thinking about this was the whole idea of the um, uh, the van der Graaft or whatever, van der Graaft, and the idea that it creates this huge field of electrical potential all the way to the ground. And you can think of like Tesla's, um, you know, a Tesla coil. Same difference, right? I mean, it's just created differently. Tesla coil is with electricity, Van de Graaff is a mechanic. It's you can be electrical, turning the motor, but um, you know Van de Graaff is spinning a belt and creating electrons that way, where the Tesla coil is actually creating an electric current to create the extra electrical potential. Um, but anyway, same difference in the end. Uh, so so you have this huge electrical potential. You can see that with like Tesla, it's, you know they get these huge arcs to ground. And you're saying, well, there has to be electrons all through that whole path, uh, and uh, you know, at, at the right potential for the electricity to travel. And the electricity doesn't really, it doesn't travel straight at all, which is kind of inducive of of what you would think of how electrons would would set things up. But regardless of that, you can, it's, it all kind of even. So so you kind of have to assume there's some sort of leveling, you know, in terms of there's not huge explosive places you know unless there's something in the atmosphere to create them so and if you have a vacuum you end up with a plasma which is which will do the same thing but it'll do it in this much flowier way it doesn't uh, it doesn't have all the in it doesn't have to go around I guess atomic structure so um, all it has is the electrons and they can be in a they can be in a more elegant curve you know they don't have to be so sparky all right. Um, so there's, some, there's just so much context to this conversation. Uh, so if I put an electron in here, let me just make it round for the right now. Then all of the, um, you know, all of the red is going to leak out now, and so it's going to be very, um, you know, there's going to be a strong, weak force here. You know, a low pressure between the protons because this. There's no blue and there's no red that can survive in this space in the sense that none of it does any back and forth. And the only thing that still exists is the fact that the field, okay, we always have to remember the field exists, you know, constantly. And so the field is putting red in. It's coming out. Uh, well, I guess that should have been a blue line. So 
it's always it's always the case it's putting some blue that comes out so it's it's putting some of the blue back and then likewise the electron is putting some red back All right, but it's very weak so the things won't crash into each other but there's really a desperate um, void created in this space and the electron is going to be it's going to go one to these two sides it's it's going to be um, uh, motivated uh, and the only thing that will stop it from crashing into the proton is the fact that the field energy is you know so just make a proton here no matter what happens there's always a little bit of blue coming out of a proton because there's always a little bit of blue coming in from different sides so there's always a little bit coming out because there's always the field energy coming in so there's always a new supply of a little bit and that little bit is where the electron is going to sit on top of that little cushion as at, at the closest potential so it can't get all the way to the proton because there's always a little bit of blue coming out and that blue has to reflect off the electron and then bounce back into the proton and be dissipated but then another piece of blue will come in so it's always going to sit on that cushion so electrons can never fall into protons and likewise electrons uh, <laughs> yeah the protons can't fall into electrons well yeah um, so see how things can never be um, that that's sort of the argument that there really is no attraction there's just an absence of strong repulsion so it's just everything always has a weak repulsion and so you can you can get close but you can't hit all right so that I thought was an interesting um, ah yeah <laughs> that's how that works all right and so the other thing I was thinking was that the electrons as I've tried to describe them are just a mechanism you know with three dimensions and they don't move very well in the sense that you know what you essentially have to do is just knock these dimensions off take this stuff and make it here so you just make it you just push it onto this these these this vector concept so it has so much stuff going this way only this little bit going this way and blah 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 so um, and every time you do that you always do it uneven because you knock off this little edge first so then it has an unevenness going this way so you end up changing its direction a little like that so you know but I've been over that um, see, see, yeah I'll have to figure out how how to um, you know maybe create some sort of video that says well these are sort of the premises for these further conversations we'll establish these as things that really happen and then let's figure out what happens, you know, the stuff we haven't figured out yet, based on these rules, let's say. All right. Um, so my point was, uh, yeah, so I was thinking about the, uh, the electron. So, you know, there's no reason to think of an electron as a round thing, essentially. I mean, it can be more square. Um, in terms of its real shape. I mean, circles are rather complicated, and squares would probably be... It would cover the same basics. And so I was thinking, if a dimension increased, it would be more like taking this basic idea of a square and saying, well, the square couldn't be shaped this way. You know, a smaller side, smaller... And have a longer side this way so it can be like a, a whatever those rectangle <laughs> can be a rect a rectangular rect rectoid <laughs> a rectoid yeah well anyway it could be something you know it can gain a shape um, based on the forces around it so let's say the forces are weaker this way so it's not getting as much pressure from these sides as it's getting strong pressure, uh, you know, from these sides, you could sort of get the idea that uh, it could change its shape conducive to that. It would spread into the lack of pressure because, see, it's made of stuff going, it's made of those ping pong balls going back and forth. 
All right, so you have to kind of understand it's as there's less ping pong balls hitting from a direction, that means these balls can go further into those fields. So the idea of it stretching could make a lot of sense. So that helps a little in terms of looking at the single slit in the sense that you know, the, one of the big problems was, I was saying to myself was, well, electrons are tiny, and we know the pattern doesn't have a zillion bars in it, so let's say there's only 20 uh, electrons in the, in the field. You know, they're just tiny, tiny, tiny little things. You know, what's the odds of the light even hitting any of them ever? Um, you know, it just seems like you have less chance, especially... Um, you know by a percentage so the idea that electrons would get thick as the field they're they're connected to let's so let's say you had a string of electrons see the this is where it's really gonna see the real game is going to be is that these things are connected in complex fields where they are all in you know force you know communication with each other so it's like Feynman diagrams on steroids e everything's got pressure between it you know there's pressure so you could say that all six sides of the square are, are a pressure field and um, you know the, the 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 box moves and stretches depending on which way the pressure is is stronger so that's what ends up balancing the pressure out is everything is everything is stretching and compressing so that the actual number of hits is the same for everybody so even if there's only there's two ping pong balls here and there's four here the idea would be is that the this this electron would stretch into the weak field okay and compress into the stronger field <clears throat> and that would add up to the same number of hits always on surfaces and so that's where you get into where this model gets you know um, unfortunately we have to start doing a lot of careful thinking <laughs> about all these subtle interactions all right so the point would be is that as <clears throat> the electrons are say they, if they're filling this slit the argument would be is the protons are leaking the force here so the blue force is leaking out this way so we know the initial electron is going to be very close to a proton, even though it's a free electron, quote unquote. Uh, well, it could be a bound electron. This could just be an electron in association still with the proton. But it still has to be in association with the proton in some sort of you know, squiggly line way. There has to be a force between them, an absence of force, excuse me. All right, so back to the Venn de Graaff idea is that you have to kind of understand that there's a a neutral pressure between all these electrons there's a ton of electrons in the atmosphere and that they all have a certain amount of pressure that is just the free electron pressure whatever you want to call it and so this space this material space because of the protons leaking the pressure this has less pressure so obviously electrons are going to fill this space and they're going to fill it in the same kind of way where they're going to try to neutralize this uneven pressure um, it's, now the, the fact is they don't succeed so that's something to, to recognize that in the, the Venn de Graaff thing right, the electrical potential is strongest close and it gets weaker so I don't know how to draw that exactly. I mean, s s close lines, I guess, and then make the lines get bigger. So it's so you have to get to this ground pressure. So that's sort of what I'm arguing. There's a there's a free electron pressure that's a certain distance, and then you're getting closer ones here. And the real thing is, is this this pressure is being is being pushed through the field it's just not being pushed through fast enough to relieve this pressure this pressure always ends up being higher because it takes time 
for it to relax. So it's just a time, it just takes time for this, you know, even at the speed of light, it takes time for the force to get uh, where it's going. And there's more coming from the, it's pushing more water than it can go through the, the gap, so to speak. They can go through the, the pressure matrix, or whatever you want to call it. It's not instantaneous. It takes time for the pressure to balance. But regardless, so the point would be is this is now, it's still seeking this relaxed. That's really what's, so I'm just saying that the tendency is going to be for the free electrons to fill that gap and establish some kind of pressure that will be relevant to have the distance of these slits. So what's going to exist as pressure between them is going to be relevant to how tight the slits are and how many electrons are in here. And that's where it gets um, interesting. So I was thinking maybe I have to watch a, you know, a single slit where they, you know, turn the thing tighter and tighter. I wish they had one where they did it really slow, like over an hour. Had a little machine turn it so that it gets closer and closer over a really long period of time so you could see each, you know, what happens exactly. Does that, does that, that bar, so they say there's 15 bars, and all of a sudden there's going to be 14. Does it just disappear, or does it fade, you know? What's uh, does that would be an interesting so so that's something to look for. I have to write that down. Look for look for disappearing bar <laughs> um, fringe or whatever they call them. Um, yeah, because that would be part of this equation. Is there's these electrons? So by my by what I speculate to be the truth, the number of electrons starts off strong and then it gets weaker and weaker because the the electrons there's too many electrons um, for the the, the 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 distance so the pressure ends up being too strong if you have too many electrons in so then they start leaving because this pressure gets uneven to the the atmospheric pressure so as you put more electrons in this pressure gets stronger which means the electrons will now leave because they're the pressure here is stronger than the free electron pressure. So as you narrow the slits, you change the number of electrons that fit between them. And um, ultimately to one electron. And that one electron might not be centered when you get really close. The one electron might be in some weird location, still tied to the two protons. All right, and so then you're just getting to the point of where the photon is released. And so the argument would be is that there's two slits. So, so this is like how I describe it when it's open. So there's some kind of balance between the electrons. They're stretched because there's less pressure here. So they stretch in the direction of less pressure. There's more pressure here and here, less pressure here, so they stretch in uh, which makes them a lot hit more hittable. And the stretch pressure, as not drawn in this drawing, would sensibly be the same as the force pressure. So that would make it so the distances would be the same. The distance between the electrons and the, the dead spaces would be um, comparable. So what I have to do is see if that would add up to... That when you figure out now the light comes in, you'll know that it's 50% of the light hits an electron if those two spaces would be the same. And then all I have to do is figure out, well, if 50% more light goes straight through without hitting an electron, what's that add up to in terms of what would that equal in terms of a, a central maxima increase? So if it was all electrons, then you'd have all pattern here. And what extra does the photons not hitting any electron add to this center? Because everything that doesn't hit an electron goes straight to this tiny center. You know, if you remember the two-slit pattern, that's where all the 
All the light that doesn't hit an electron, in theory, is the light that goes to the center. Um, so I'll have to see if that comes out to 50%. If, if you take 50% of the light and put it into the center, is the other 50% of the light in the pattern plus whatever 10% you'd figure for the, the actual middle. So if you take the middle and you give it whatever its allocation is, 5%, and then you add up all of the outside stuff. Does this outside stuff add up to plus the little bit that this middle would get as its proportion? Add up to 50%. That would be, <laughs> that would confirm at least that part of the theory. Uh, I mean, it would be uh, helpful evidence. Um, all right, so um, almost uh, almost done. I, I, you know, I, I'm just this is just like I said, this is just stuff I, I'm trying to work it out in my own head. So I thought making a video would help, and I think it has. I mean, I got a couple of things to look for here that I didn't think of. <laughs> so it really, I guess talking to yourself is probably a good idea, even if I don't have a camera in my hand, right? And just pretend to make videos, and that'll help me think through some processes that um, you know might provide solution. All right, so I'm, I'm back at the, I'm running out of drawing space, so that's a good reason to quit soon. All right, so the idea would be is there's electrons, so we just do them as dots now, but you know, I'm saying they're, they're bigger than dots. And the real trick is now is to figure out now a, a light comes in straight, theoretically, fairly straight, maybe a tiny bit of an angle, but fairly straight. And it has to hit one of these things, and somehow light has to come out crooked at a specific angle. And that's really, that's the pattern. Okay. And so <clears throat> what I'm arguing is, is that, you know, there would be, obviously, there's field electrons on either side of these ones that are lining up on the protons. And... So there would be other electrons in positions, and the question is, would they line up this way? Okay, and then you'd end up with a, you know, a matrix of, you know, they're off centers to each other, because that would make for balances in terms of all the lines would be the same distance. But it's really not about distance; it's about the force, and um, you know, the impact number. That's what they're all trying to seek, is the same impact number. So, but anyway, so you would think that if this moved a little bit forward, um, because it got hit by a photon, it compressed this, you know, these angles. Then there would be two angles it's compressing, or two angles it's changing, which makes it just complicated. So that doesn't really work for me. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean you have to think too in terms of these things. You know how 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 exactly they relate to each other depends on this whole idea of of you know if you take a round thing and then you have this pressure between them at different ang you know two different things in different planes. I mean if you make it completely random. Um, then every time it, you know, it could move, if it moves this way, then this force gets free that way, and then this force gets free this way, and this force gets free that way. Yeah, so they all escape, in a sense. So there has to be a mechanism, you know, like a, a facetedness, a thickness, that allows the electron to move, some, but not enough to release the photon. So it's like you got a square and the force is here. And so if you move the square a little, you know, the force will still be hitting the square. You know, it'll still be covered. So you can move a little without releasing the photon, but it takes a certain amount of movement for you to release the photon. So you jitter and then pop back, you jitter, so it would be just like a shutter opening. You let the, folk, the, the some of the ping pong balls get loose, 
and it closes again and that would be the the photon so the point is is that there's a a squiggly line of a certain potential goes in and that's your piece of light your photon and a certain you know piece of a certain length is going to come out so it's there's a conversion i mean it's not the same photon and um but the force would equal out so because it's all in the one direction and there's going to be one movement in the end that's the movement that releases the photon so anyway that's where i'm kind of just you know i'm sitting here with different ideas about you know if the electron is shaped sort of this way the photon hits it this way maybe it tilts it this way uh you know and then that puts you know f somehow that creates a force on the other one that tilts it that way and then that releases the photon between it and that but that would end up just releasing it straight well, anyway so that's where i'm sort of just kind of stuck is trying to figure out the angles so if somebody wants to play with that and uh, figure out a a mechanism where you know somewhere in the process the photon hits the first of the electron it hits and somehow hitting that electron cascades into a process that eventually leads to an electron going maybe even going straight but going straight and releasing a photon going that way so and that angle is just dependent on the frequency of the light the bluer the light the tighter the the angle the redder the light the wider the angle yeah um yeah which tends to make you think that if it was this way and it was moved this way the blue light would move it more up <laughs> you know and so that would be the tighter thing and then the red would move it less up so that would be the wider so the red's going wider the blue's going narrower so at least if it's tilting this way you can sort of get the idea that okay the blue would tilt it more than the red um, but I, I, I I'm not at all certain that has anything to do with it <laughs> I mean I'm not all certain that um, well I'm certain that there's some mechanism like that that's just something that and, and again, let me stress <clears> that the reason why this happens is, is because of the three-dimensional... Let me draw that one more time. Um, say, you know, in a closed system, you know, here's your electron, let's say, and some... The, the, the energy comes in, and it's going to leave this way. And I could should have drawn that as blue, but what the hell. Um, what it's really doing is the red thing is hitting a blue thing going this way and the red thing goes this way and the blue thing changes its direction to this way so what you've really done is taken one of these this and you've moved it here so you now have more blue going this way than you have going that way and you have more blue going this way than you have going that way so this will be crooked, theoretically. So I think that has something to do with it. Um, just throwing that in there. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so that's probably a, probably enough, and I'll do some more thinking. Yeah, it's just going to take some. See, I, was, I, know, I know the thing is, you come up with something really simple and really um, solid. You know, then we can end most of this stupid debate because I have, will have abolished entirely the all the crap that's dependent on this stupid uh, wave theory regarding the stupid single and double slit experiments you get rid of Huygens and Heisenberg and you know you get rid of all this this stupid wave woo um, so it's an, it would be a it would be to my advantage to be able to come up with a really um, un you know something simple yet um, <laughs> something simple and 
no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't need see the proof is always going to be difficult because you you, just, you you can only go by the symptoms. You know, so we all know what the common, we know what the effect is, and we can speculate about causes, but it's really hard to photograph causes. So all you're looking for is some explanation that fits the effect and does it in some sort of way that's reasonable. And, um, you know, the fewer moving parts you have, the better, but, um, you know, ultimately, um, proof is going to be difficult. Like I say, if I can prove that the when the pattern gets narrower, there's a point where the the the, the outside bar just disappears. I mean, boom, it's gone. It doesn't just diminish. You know, it doesn't get fade. It just disappears. <laughs> you know, that would be um, on my side because that wouldn't be very wave-like. All right, anyway, so, uh, enough of a video. So, um, I guess I'll do a, um, you know, well, no point in promising. A bit tired, <laughs> so we'll just see. I mean, I want to do a video on the mock <laughs> gravity explaining things to Piero and others, you know, about just <clears throat> what a, you know, Einstein's bent space is essentially particle gravity. I mean, it's the same difference. He's creating a stream that the planets are getting, that, are, that they're flowing in. You know, that they're, they're having to, they're, they're, getting, they're getting rolled down the stream. They're getting pushed by the water, so to speak. And that's all bent space is. And uh, so for Piro to say it's unimaginable, it's almost ludicrous, in the sense that that's all Einstein's bent space is. It's, it's, it's effectively um, particle gravity, except it doesn't account for the source. It just has a, an imaginary, we'll just take whatever goes into the drain and we'll automatically put it on top of the waterfall. But it's, it's so, so it's less accountable version of particle gravity, which is very ironic. Uh, that Piro can't understand how it could work. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. So maybe that's next. <laughs>